Good afternoon, and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens. Today, we are joined by two extraordinary designers, plants people, opinionated people that are going to help you decide how to put together a design or give you some tips to think about anyway when you're putting together a design. It's the first time we've had two people on at the exact same time, so I'm really looking forward to this. My name is Cindy Brown. I am the Manager of Collections, Education, and Access here at Smithsonian Gardens, and as always, we hope you enjoy this hour with us. We want you to put your questions in the chat box, not in the Q&A section, but in the chat box. And what Janet and Scott have told me is there's probably not going to be time for <laughs> answers, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, so I'm going to get off very quickly, but I want to thank you all for joining us. And I thank you for spending an afternoon on a nice day outside, inside with us and watching. As always, the Recording will be available on our Let's Talk Gardens video library in about two weeks after we do some editing on the closed captioning. Because if you follow closed captioning, which you can just by pushing the CC button on your screen, uh, you'll see that some funny words come out of what, what doesn't really come out of our mouths, but they translate it to uh, not be as intelligent as I know Scott and Janet really are. So with that, Scott and Janet, I'm going to disappear. You take it away. You tell them what you're going to talk about. And I know that the people are going to be hypnotized and mesmerized by what you say and tell us today. Thanks. I'll be back. Bye, Cindy. Bye, Thank Cindy. you. Thank you, Cynthia. Well, that certainly is the goal to hypnotize and mesmerize you with our plantings. My name is Scott Scarfone. I'm a landscape architect. I've been in practice for 30 years. We'll talk, talk a little bit about that later. And this is my partner in crime. Janet Draper. I play in the dirt in the Ripley Garden. So, and I'll, I'll show you the, our different perspectives. Scott thinks big scale and I I think tiny scale because the Ripley Garden is only a third of an acre. So I can't have mass expanses. So same concepts, different, different scale. Right. So that's why we're paired together is because we have different perspectives. I have a global higher perspective as a designer and a landscape architect. Yeah, global. Yeah. We're going to show you pictures of gardens from all over the world. And then Janet is literally in the weeds. She's in the dirt and she's filling in all the gaps that I miss. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to cover. So, so really, plantings are hypnotizing when they first and foremost grab your attention, right? And we're going to show you that. We don't so, want boring. We don't want boring. So, right, when I use the term global, the point is that we're going to show you amazing imagery that both Janet and I have taken throughout our years of travel around the world of plantings that we think are hypnotic. And so we have these collection of slides, and now we've organized them into a presentation to share with you today. We want them to evoke your emotion. So generally something that's powerful or hypnotic, it's gonna trigger some kind of emotional response in you, just like a really good painting does, just mm -hmm. like a really good opera does, just like a really good planting design does. Mm -hmm. um, we want uh, plantings that possess striking color, form, texture, or placement, something, something that's really gonna grab you. And they stand out from their su surroundings because they're unusual. Again, we boring plantings aren't going to do it. That's not what we do. Yeah. So they're sculptural. So, you know, we need to think about plants in terms of the form that they possess and the beauty and the shape that they have. Because at the end of the day, and we'll get into this a little later, after the flowers are gone, it's the shape that's left. So we really want to think about the sculptural effect of this plant. We want plantings that appear exotic or have characteristics that you don't normally see. So this is what really makes a composition exciting is trying to think about plant material that maybe you don't typically see. Something that's a little different, something that's arresting, something that grabs your eyes, something that's different. That's what makes it exciting. And bold. Just, you know, just like Janet. Yeah, we don't want wimpy plantings. So, and then... Um, the, the really one of the hallmarks is to illustrate an overall minimalistic appearance that can contain complex design principles. So this is the really 
really, really hard thing about planting design, particularly as a plants person, and I'm a plants person, you get trapped in the idea that you want to use all your favorite plants in one place. Got to have them all. It, well, that doesn't always work, Janet, and we're going to show you why in a little bit. So, Janet? Yeah, this is my playground, and, and hopefully many of you have been to it. Um, I am the luckiest of the gardeners at Smithsonian because this garden has no theme. Uh, my theme from the moment I arrived was to, I wanted to show people plants they normally don't see. So, you know, showcase the underdogs or the ones that that don't have the press agent. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a nerd. I try and shove it all in. You're not a nerd. You're a plant geek. Okay. Right. Whatever. And I'm kind of just an all-around guy all over the map. Maybe I don't really know what I am. So, again, as I mentioned, I'm a landscape architect. I've actually authored a book um, called Professional Planting Design. So I do have a little bit of experience in this. But I've also been very fortunate to have studied horticulture. I was a fellow at the, the Great Garden Chanticleer, where I really got to travel around the world and mm -hmm. actually garden. So I know actually how to design with plants. Um, but I've also been fortunate in my professional practice to work in a lot of public gardens around the United States where I've got to work with desert material, tropical material, um, mid-Atlantic zone, you know, five through eight material. So I've, I'm fortunate to be able to work in my practice with a lot of different types of plant material, as does Janet in the Ripley Garden. And so you really get to understand um, some striking characteristics when you start looking at plant material that are outside your typical zone. And I always like to call that zonal envy. Or zonal denial. So one of the first concepts that we like to bring in is called mass, mass, max for greater impact. So this is the exact opposite of those of you that like to use every single plant that you can lay your hands on, Janet. And so what this yeah. does is this starts to create simplicity in the garden. It also creates a framework in the garden. So depending on how you use it, you see the slide in the upper right where you could create really dramatic patterns. So what really what you're trying to do is not necessarily um, exercise your horticultural depth as you are trying mm -hmm. to paint in the landscape. Mm -hmm. Whereas at the bottom slide, you could see that massing starts to create opportunities to do some finer scale things um, within that. Mm -hmm. And that is why the tidal basin with the cherries is just so powerful. It's simple, simple, simple. It's one plant that is used in mass. And oh, talk about pulling the heartstrings when the, the cherries are all in bloom. So here we look at different types of massing. So in the lower left-hand slide, these are a bunch of different aloes that are planted on a slope side. This is actually in a garden outside of San Diego, California. So you can see a mass, mass, mac, that's the same kind of plant, but different varieties uh, mm -hmm. of the same plant. Again, the top left slide, those are all ferns. Now, there's two different types of ferns there, right? There's a tree fern, which I don't know. Is that technically considered a fern? No, it's no. not technically, but let's call it a fern. But it fundamentally looks like a big fern. And so by using the scale differential, um, but still massing it, you create a pretty powerful scene. And it's basically mm -hmm. the same plant. And then down on the, the big picture on the right, that's some of my work. Um, massing, too, is massing, especially when you've got things like the beautiful yucca rostrata that is so striking on its own. But on its own, it's great. Add more, and it's even better. So you're, you're exaggerating the unique features of that particular plant by massing it the way you're doing it. Here's another example of how you exaggerate the unique features by using so many of these together, right? You're really emphasizing, you're putting power to that plant. So you can see this is actually in the left, an older image of the Getty. That planting yeah. is no longer there, cool. but you see the mass plantings of the small round barrel cactus in the foreground. How when you put so many of them together, you get just an amazing, amazing impact. Now this entire composition on the left is with four plants but look how powerful it is. Um, the slide on the same slide on the upper right-hand corner, again, the contrast of the columnar forms of the old man cactus versus the round forms of the mammillarias underneath of it, you can see the contrast between the two, two different types of plants, but yet a very powerful planting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and then it's always good that occasionally instead of massing, you just have one. 
you know, the one guy that stands out there all of its own and holds the, the stage alone. And by only having one, and you want something dramatic as a Lone Ranger, it, it gets full stage and everything, the spotlight is on it. So we call this the isolationist. So if you think those of you that are writers out there, think about when you're writing a paragraph and you use, you use one sentence where you have an exclamation point, right? You're using that exclamation point to make a statement. Now, you don't want to have a paragraph with all sentences with exclamation points. And that's why we want to use this in a very limited capacity. So you could see here, again, choosing one special plant, one plant that has a very unique characteristic to that. And that's something that you want to highlight in your composition. And you really do that in two ways. One is you make sure you only use one, but you make sure that all the plantings around it are incredibly simple. So if you look at the monkey puzzle tree on the right hand side, you see the foreground is just incredibly simple. It's of a grass. It's completely contrasting. And it's letting the power of that unique form of that mon monkey puzzle tree stand out on its own. Mm -hmm. um, here again, Lone Ranger having that one so so Waro cactus stand out. Uh, you've got all the barrel cactus down below, and then that exclamation point. So those um, forms those forms contrast one another. So mm -hmm. not only is it one powerful plant that is a different shape or form, but it contrasts itself. Mm -hmm. So you look at the planting in the upper left, that's actually the garden at Chanticleer. Chanticleer. Now you, you can argue and say, well, oh, there's more than one there, but there's three. And so that they're used very carefully. Um, they still kind of are isolated. They're still kind of unique Lone mm -hmm. Ranger forms, right? But look at the rest of the composition around it. It's very simple composition. So it allows the unique um, characteristics. I believe those are uh, junipers mm -hmm. to tortilla junipers. Yeah. I believe it allows those to really, you know, stand out on their own. And then um, you can have a mass, but then every once in a while we'll have one that's a little separate, like like this um, lovely little one uh, growing in the wall in the Ripley Garden, the, you know, the escaped convict. Up above on the top of the wall, there's a whole mass of them, but having one uh, is separate. So it sort of draws your eye and completes the picture. It also gives you a, a unique way to look at that particular plant. Yeah. So you see it in mass with a group of plants. It gives you one um, sort of feeling. And then the one that kind of pops out to the side gives you a whole another feeling. Yeah. So, uh, you know, like again, like to call it the escaped convict. It just gives you kind of an interesting feel for how to have those plant compositions working. Um, accent. So here we're really talking about contrast. Um, and we're talking about contrast can be in many different ways. It could be contrast in color, contrast in shape, contrast in form, um, contrast in scale. And so the contrast is what makes things exciting. Exciting. So think about the seven up can, right? The little red dot, how it pops out from the green behind that, that is contrast. And so here you can see different examples of contrast of form, of color, of texture, and how really powerful that makes that composition. Ah, texture. This is my wheelhouse. Um, it, it's all about contrasting the texture to make a plant shine. Um, they can all be greens. They can all be um, the same color, but the texture really brings out how gorgeous each individual is. And this is a really important hallmark to understand in planting design because people generally tend to think that you have to have a lot of color yes. in planting design to make it successful. And I think hopefully through these four images, you can see here simply by using texture, right? These are all shades of green. Green and, is a color too. Right. And it makes an amazing um, plant composition. One of the ones I like the best is the upper right hand yeah. corner where you see the contrast of the big palmate leaf, bold. bold leaf against the fine textured of, I believe that's a Dawn Redwood. Mm -hmm. And so just the contrast of the texture really is impactful. Yeah. And and here's um, two of the images playing in the Ripley Garden. You know, the spiny guy, the Selenum ketoense on the left within the feathery foliage, just 
really makes it more dramatic how spiny that selenium is. And all of this, the work doesn't have to be done just with live plants. Um, using those same these same principles we're talking about, you can you can you make an art like that is a close up of an insect house that I have in the Ripley Garden. It's all about texture. All about texture. So color. This is um, actually something that I love and I hate at the same time, and I talk about it equally passionately <laughs> on both sides of the fence. You know, I mean color. Um, obviously is an amazing thing. It's a beautiful thing. Everybody loves color. But I think as a planting designer, particularly as young designers um, working on uh, gaining their skill and working with planting compositions, there's there's there tends to be an over-reliance mm -hmm. on color. Yeah. And and I always like to think that, you know, col color is like your teenage years. It's fleeting. You, know, <laughs> you, you blink and it's gone. And then what are you left with? You're left with green, right? The rest of your life. And so, you know, how do you learn to manage the expectations of, of color, um, you know, in a landscape? Now, that being said, color is a very important aspect, and there are different ways to use it. So here, you know, we're talking about how do we contrast color. Now, the other thing to notice in, in these slides that we're showing is once you start to understand some of these concepts, and you start to look at these slides, and actually you'll start to see some of the slides that I we use more than once here, there's a reason for that because good design, you could pick it apart and find multiple design principles in the same slide. And that's what makes it a good mm -hmm. design, right? Is 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 those composition elements that, that come through again and again. So color, the lower right-hand corner, that's in Cook and F Gardens, right? That's crazy color. Like it doesn't even make sense putting pinks with yellows, right? I mean, that breaks the rules, but it kind of does work. It and, slaps you around, that's and, for sure. Right, so there's there's nothing wrong with experimenting, but you can see how powerful that is. That's just strictly to knock people off their socks for the sake of color, for color's sake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, we switch gears now. Color, right to contrast. Yeah, uh, well, um, I'm not sure what all to say about this other than um, you, you can... So contrast, we're talking about the form, oh, right? So where we went from contrast we to color, about. we're going to form. So you're looking at the different forms. So for instance, again, the upper right-hand corner, the contrast of the vertical columnar plants against the round plants uh, of the barrel cactus, how that contrast um, really makes those things stand out. The bottom slide, the contrast. So look at where the emphasis is. One of the exercises I always like to have people do is close your eyes for a minute and then open your eyes and look at that picture. Where does your eye start and where does it end up? I promise you, if you do this again and again, your eye will end up on that columnar verbascum and it'll shoot up like a skyrocket and end with the yellow. And that's just something to train yourself, train your eye to understand how your eye moves through the composition. It's the contrast to that verbascum that catches your eye and pulls your eye and runs that up through. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, my favorite. Oh, uh, <laughs> your favorite? No, no, no. They, you, you know, you can have that one. Okay, so this was a picture I took in um, a garden in Thailand called Nang Nuch, and this is a theme planting. So this is where you basically... There's a lot of things going on, here, right? I mean, but it, the, the, the point is it's a theme. So it's one type of plant used in mass to make an impact. And so these are all canas and you can see just how powerful this is. Now, you can argue that there's not a lot of contrast with the form of the plant here. I mean, you can tear this apart in other aspects, but the cultivar, the sheer mass, uh, the sheer um, volume of this one kind of plant and of course all the different colors mm -hmm. make this incredibly powerful yeah that was a collection to me more of a collection of all the same and the same thing here these are cultivar collections where there will be a lot of similarities and it will be all the same and those are powerful on their own to me, I find them quite boring. Right. As a as a plant geek, you would, right? Well, not only that, it, it's just, they, they don't sing together. They don't have the backup singers helping accentuate anything. Right. It's so, just all the same. So what's important in an aspect of, of this would be, would be context as to where 
the garden was located, where the simplicity of the cultivar was located. The top middle picture is a garden in Tokyo, Japan, and those are all iris, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think the context of having an iris collection set in a garden like this is really powerful. Now, again, you can argue there's not a lot of excitement going on there in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. flor floral nature, in mm -hmm. terms of the contrast to texture and color, horticultural diversity. It's not here. But in terms of a powerful collection amidst this garden, it's it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, and the middle, lower middle picture, that's the Gatelli conifer collection yeah. at the U.S. National Arboretum. It's all collections of conifers, right? Looks the same 365 days a year. But look what they're doing there. They're comp they're contrasting the texture, the form, the color, and that's what's making mm -hmm. that work. So cultivar collections used in the right context and used correctly it's just another tool in your toolbox yeah. from a planting design perspective. Mm -hmm. And then I, I'll do more theme plantings, upper right uh, or upper left is uh, all plants with similar shape and form. They all happen to be mangaves or, or um, aloes, um, but putting them all together is very strong. And then down below, Beth Chattos, her her container garden, all these terracotta pots and everything. So you just, by bringing them all together, it's a very strong impact. If you had one pot here and one pot there and one pot there, they'd look lonely and, and not have the strength of similar items put together. So it's a similar concept of mass mass, yeah. right? You're, you're massing the same general kind of plant but different cultivars. So again, the Beth mm -hmm. Chattogar, those are all basically hens and chicks. Yeah. And so there's so many of them together. It's just, it's very powerful collection. And then you can choose um, a theme planting based on color. Um, that's usually how I work. I start with, oh, I want orange and blues in this bed. And those are the plant choices that I'll make. Or they're at Longwood, the top left. That is the silver garden, which is so, so powerful and so cool. And then down at bottom right, all bromeliads, all bromeliads and tropicals of similar shape and cultural needs. But wow, you mass them together and they're really awesome. So one of the key messages is about this slide is, you know, you as the designer are making a conscious decision to assign a particular theme to that composition. Mm -hmm. You're not going out there and willy-nilly just grabbing plants and placing them together because you got them on sale or your neighbor gave this to you or you're dividing them and this is what you have left over. I mean, there's places in the garden mm -hmm. for that, but there's also many better places to be more organized in the framework that you create for that garden. This is one of my favorite car color harmonies. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of get trapped in this a lot. I, Me personally, um, I'm a pink and purple guy. And so the image in the upper left, which is Filoli in California, that's something that really sings to my heart. Um, I'm working on a perennial border at home right now, and it's basically looking like this. Oh. So my theme is pinks and purples, right? So this is something that you're consciously making as a designer to make that garden sing by. The lower left-hand corner, that's actually at um, Great Dixter in England. There, you know, they're using your warm colors to basically create that theme um of those colors and um uh, on the right hand side that's the ripley garden and that's um those chrysanthemums are in bloom right now uh that's jessamine moonlight and i i love to play off knowing uh just shades of yellow yellows and silvers and at various other times of the year there's some reds in there so my my color theme for that yellow yellow, red, and silver. So <clears throat> impact of the exotic. This is another one of my favorites. And I know for sure it's Janet's because she just loves this stuff in the mm -hmm. Ripley garden. And you can see the drama that it creates in a garden. Why? Not only is it exotic, but look at the power of the shapes of that foliage, right? It's so dramatic. It's so large. It's yeah. so powerful it's so exotic right i mean bananas that you automatically think you're in a tropic somewhere go Parti big or go home right and so particularly in our environment to use a plant like this which is becoming more and more common and more and more hardy that's a whole other subject 
but it's pretty impressive to use this. Yeah, it's fun. I have castor beans uh, nice. up to the second floor of arts and industries right now. Wow. There. There's a castor oh. bean in the lower left hand yep. corner right uh -huh. behind the banana. The, the red one. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yep. Uh, tropicals. Uh, in our area, tropicals just, I mean, they're so unexpected. Yes, you do have to work a little, little harder uh, in this area because they're not going to make it through the winter. But gosh, for the impact that they can make in the summer, uh, they are just so wonderful. So, so we'd encourage you to try experimenting with these. I mean, they're so cheap anymore. You can find them early in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, many of them are now being able to be overwintered because of our mild winters, or maybe you can overwinter them for two or three winters yeah. before they really get whacked back. Mm -hmm. They're cheap. They're easy to use. I mean, basically think of it as like an annual and they're mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Um, and just try something different. So like, you know, the lower right-hand corner was a show that I worked on at Phipps Conservatory. And we specifically tried to pair springtime bulbs with tropical plants oh, it's cool. because it was just different and people would not expect that uh -huh. and it was really well it was interesting the feedback we got on that yeah. people were expecting the spring stuff yeah and when they saw the, the Tropical. tropicals that threw them for a curve this is the traditional oh. show yeah exactly so that was good we got people to think about what is not normally traditional yeah and also there's no reason you can't take your house plants on a vacation and stick them out it's a good for the summer vacation. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, don't we all? Who doesn't want to be outside? Don't we all? I do. Uh, you know, again, look at the impact here. Um, it's tropical, tropical, tropical. Yes, uh, many of these things will not start getting getting going until later in the season, but the impact. Look at that shizalobium that is like, oh. And the dahlias so too. Cool. You know, even though the dahlias are not, I mean, they're not technically tropicals, are they? They are not tropical. But they look tropical. They look tropical. They bloom late in the season. Um, and then having something with burgundy foliage just helps it pop. So I think, you know, one of the hallmarks of tropical, uh, tropical and subtropical plants is really their bold foliage and so mm -hmm. if you yeah. don't have the opportunity to use or find or spend a little extra money on tropical plants think about your regional plants that have bolder foliage like mm -hmm. some of your bigger hostas can have that tropical or subtropical feel so there are there are hardy plants that are local here that you, you can use those mm -hmm. it's just making an emphasis to focus on those plants in your composition or growing them from seed growing them from seed yeah, they're they're not going to be big early in the spring, but by the end of the summer, whoo! Um, this is another one of my favorite slides. I think things that I, yeah, I know. Well, I'm a plant eat Well, so why is it why is it one of my favorites? Because it's very very simple, right? There's there's basically three plants, except I think maybe there's four. Four, right? But fundamentally, there's three. But yeah, yeah, there's four, and I don't even know which one that those ones are. But you know, you look at this. And it's just very simple. But the point of this is the thread, right? It's this purple that's threaded throughout this entire composition that mm -hmm. helps pull it together. So the concept is a thread. It's a repetitive element that's repeated through the entire composition that helps pull it together. Now, this mm -hmm. particular slide is a very simple composition. But if we go to the next slide, we start to see threads coming through and a more mm -hmm. complex composition and it's what helps pull it together. So I'm going to let mm -hmm. Janet talk about the red in the left image. The red in the left. Um, the the Monarda or the the Barberry? Both. Which one? Oh, well, both of those, like the Barberry, this burgundy mass coming down, that, even though Barberry is invasive, but we're using that as the example here, um, the Barberry is just like this oozy mass of lava. That, that ties everything together. And then those dots of Monarda that are repeated up the hill just automatically draws your eye up the hill. Right, so the red Monarda is really the thread. So if you look at the composition, there's a lot of stuff going on there with the perennials, but it's that repetition, it's that thread of red that's repeated through that composition that helps keep it all together. And the thread of red on the left was also, ooh, Correct. thread of red. So more Ooh. threads here. Lots, lots of threads. Um, it, um, 
both of these are the Ripley Garden. I love, you know, to me, it's like trying to put something in where your eye will just follow. Um, I often call it a river or something like that, where your your eye is just drawn through because the same color is repeated. Red. Red. Um, close allies. So these are things that are similar but different. So if we look here in the upper right hand corner, we got the Lariope spicata with the agave. It's the same form of the plant, but the scale is different. Totally so different. there's repetition going on there. There's scale going on there. Um, they're complementary. The lower le uh, right hand slide, the canas that have the red flowers that are sitting up top and then the foil of the red salvia underneath. So they're complementary. Mm -hmm. um, colonies, having uh, various uh, shapes that repeat, uh, but having them different sizes. If if they're all the same size, it's just a, a mass of, yeah, a mass of one. But if you have similar shapes and different sizes, that will tie them together. So I cheat using this one a lot of times when I only have one plant, but I've got some other things that look similar. So by putting them all together, I can create more impact without having to have you know, all the same. So again, these are these are little tricks, right? These are little tools that you have in your toolbox. Now notice about this slide, there's no color here, right? We're strictly relying on the form of the plant, but the contrast of the size of the form to make the impact in that composition. So really important. Again, I keep harping on color, but you can see here how impactful mm -hmm. a composition can be without color. You're strictly relying on the form of the plant. Colonies, it's just, again, repeating. I mean, Scott is very uh, much better with words than I am, but this is the same com concept of different shapes, putting, massing them together, um, and just, I don't know. Right. So again, the slide, the slide on the right, which is at Chanticleer, Chanticleer. Um, Dan from our six work, you can see the basically these are sort of their this is called strap like foliage it's they're kind of like straps now there's different sizes of straps you have narrow straps you have mid-sized straps and then you have thick straps mm -hmm. and so you're basically putting all of these contrasting size of the same form of type of foliage of plant together a little little bit of color differentiation mm -hmm. but you can see how powerful it is again look no color yeah. but it's the form and the texture of the foliage that's making the contrast. Now the pots help. I, I was just gonna say the pots the, actually help. The pots repeat that same thing. They're they're not the same. They're not all identical pots, but they tie together well because they have the unifying plants that just right. Yeah, it it all adds up. Uh, yeah, uh, color overwhelming. Overwhelming. Right? Slap so, you around. Right. So this is just really yet. Yeah, literal i mean you overwhelm people with color there's so much color there that literally you're overwhelmed and i think mm -hmm. you know the upper left hand corner those of you that have never seen the late summer border at longwood gardens mm -hmm. um the annual border they overwhelm you with color again a lot of lessons so look there's masses in there mass 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 for impact right there's overwhelming color there there's contrast of forms right you have the upright u um, in that bed of, I think that's a colia, a red coleus. So you can start to see, once you learn the techniques, you can start to take a picture and tear it apart to understand why it's working. And it could fit earlier, uh, Scott mentioned, that that same picture shows numerous concepts. Like this one. Yeah. So this one, again, focusing on color, I call this a menagerie of colors, right? This, this is where you just get nuts and throw it all together and not worry about it. Now, that being said, there needs to be something in that composition that ties it all together. Mm -hmm. And there are two things in this composition that bring it all together. First is the Verbenia bonariensis, the purple, right? That's a thread, right? That's going through this entire composition. It's strapping it, tying it together. 
And then there, of course, is the banana. banana. Right? There's only two of those plants, but the foliage is so dramatic and powerful enough and widespread enough that that mm -hmm. helps calm your eye down. So really what this is about is helping your eye and your mind, right, settle down and tie it together. So when what happens is, again, train your eye to watch how it moves. What happens in this scene is your eye is floating all over the place, and then it needs to calm down for a minute. It'll settle on the purple. Once your mind and brain wrap your head around it, you'll start to float around again, and then you'll come back and you'll settle. And that's mm -hmm. what makes this work. So again, it's a sort of a conscious effort of you learning how to watch how your eye and your mind work and move through a composition that starts to help you understand how to put this stuff yeah. together. Yeah, and I settle on the green. You, yeah. I, I do I, not settle on the purple. I My think at the eye end of the day, yeah. goes to the green. I agree, because that's the calmest. Yeah. And you need mm -hmm. that. Oh, color harmonies, again, it's just playing off uh keep staying within the same color tones and things like that and just playing it's right so playing so like music so learning how to paint so when i teach my class i always say the best way to learn color harmonies and color rhythms is to study monet's paintings monet used to go out and actually paint the same scene in four different colors mm -hmm. four different color harmonies and so you can really start to see the contrast so here we're talking about using complementary and analogous color schemes. So the upper right-hand corner is called an analogous composition. That's where the colors are right next to one another on a color wheel. They're generally softly related. Whereas if you go to, and the top left is an analogous color scheme as well. Whereas the bottom, the pinks and the blues, those are complementary. Those are opposite one of the, another on the color wheel. And those are more powerful in terms of their contrast. Um, so, but you're again, specifically picking a harmony that you're gonna theme, again, we've heard that term before, the theme, that you're gonna theme your planting composition on. Mm, color echoes. echoes, just playing off, you know, one color playing off the other or repeating that same color with the Eucomus, that burgundy color in the bottom left, and then repeating that higher up in the sky with the uh, lilium, the stargazer lilies. Um, so the echoes is really, you're just kind of taking one color mm -hmm. and you're kind of echoing it. So it's not necessarily going to be the same color, but it's going to be variations of that color. So shades. Shades, right? So even the middle slide, the Camassia and the top middle slide, look at the foliage. The foliage has sort of a bluish tint to it. That is actually an echo of that light purple. Oh. Is that a neat, not even? It's not it. Uh, that's not. No, that's no. That's it's that's a, a, she's a, a snacky. It's a lavender, and then in front of it is an is that iridium. Oh, there yeah. you go. Okay. But but the concept is Sick. is right. Okay. Oh, uh, repetition, repetition. I I actually do this in the Ripley. Um, really? Yeah, I mean, that's Ripley right there. Well, it is, isn't it? It's I mean, little... More than one is is repeating. This so is so there's two. Right. Um, yeah. I often will um because the garden beds are so busy, some of the pots that I'll put between the benches, I'll repeat the same very simple planting just to give some calmness and just repetition right. it, it and draws you along repetition could be considered a thread mm -hmm. right so some yeah. of these terms overlap so what janet just described is using repetition as a thread to tie it together the repetition in itself could just be a design element so if you look at the uh, equestress in the lower right hand corner that's from actually a uh, hotel in arizona that's cool you can see basically it's just a simple repetition of one plant used very uniquely, almost kind of like a Lone Ranger concept, mm -hmm. right? But you're repeating this now. And so it's just a very powerful impact. So again, be thinking about simplicity in your design and how powerful um, these statements can see. The upper left-hand corner, oh, the repetition oh, awesome. of Thailand and Nang Nuch, this palm is a Washingtonia palm, which to me is one of my absolute favorite palms. Rare. And you can just see how the repetition of that unique plant is incredibly powerful um, in terms of a composition. Again, there's three, two types of plants there, multiple forms, oh. um, and no color. 
and it's incredibly powerful. Repetition. Mm-hmm. Repetition of color. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've talked about it before. I think the pictures speak a thousand words. Mm-hmm. Um, I particularly like the upper left-hand corner. Now you can argue, you know, I mean, these are debatable from a planting design perspective. You could say, oh, you know, that's boring. There's not a horticult- lot of horticultural variety there. I want more color. But one color repeated it's like really that awesome. is, is really awesome and real mm-hmm. powerful, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Repetition yeah. of form. So again, we saw that. This is again, the Nang Nuch Garden um, in Thailand. There's so much going on here. I mean, I could talk about this slide forever. So this was a play off of the French um, Garden Versailles um, done in a very different sort of unique way. And we have a lot of things going on here in terms of repetition. So obviously the first thing to me that stands out is the conical forms of the U's, the repetition of that. Um, We have the repetition of the reds, um, how that ties everything together. We have the repetition of that diamond pattern Uh, in the foreground that repeats. So there's a lot of repetition going on here in a very complex manner. Mm -hmm. So even though this garden is actually the layout geometrically is very simplistic, the complexity built within that simplicity um, is is pretty staggering um, when you think about that. So again, repetition. Yep. And you don't have to have repetition on such a massive scale. Uh, here, uh, my friend Dan Benarsik up at Chanticleer uses repetition by the same way I do in the Ripley, those containers, exactly the same composition. So so it ties it all together. Those meatballs down on the bottom, bottom left. Um, it's actually quite lovely because it's uh, it's intentional and they thought about it rather than just going out and whacking right. whacking some shrubs. So the lower image is, is, a, is a great image, I think. That's the New York Botanic Garden. And you see the lower rep- right. Or excuse me, lower right. Yeah, thank you. The lower right, um, the repetition of the columnar, um, I think I think those are arborvitaes. Um, but mm-hmm. what that does is that gives your, your, your brain uh, an opportunity to make sense of all the insanity that's going on behind it. Now, it's a good insanity. But your brain needs to process all that. And so the repetition of those elements allows your brain to kind of start to make sense Mm -hmm. of everything that's going on behind it. And so, again, it's thinking about how your eyes and your mind process what you're looking at is what makes a good composition from a bad composition. And your eyes and your brain, they they, they need places to rest Mm -hmm. every once in a while. Not everything could be crazy horticultural craziness. Same thing in the top slide. This is um, in Chicago. Um, I'm trying to think of the conservatory. But anyways, um, great planting there. But again, these columnar um, mm-hmm. arborvitaes really start to make sense of all the planting insanity. And I say that in a passionately beautiful way because mm-hmm. it's a beautiful composition. But it starts to make sense and allow it gives your eyes a chance to rest it gives your brain a chance to make sense of all that planting insanity yeah. in a beautiful way going on around it. Oh, repeating the similar shapes. Uh, again, massing shapes, looking at the shapes, looking at the color. Uh, these these are all different, but they have a similar link that tie them together. And it could be cultural. It could be uh, just their mass bulk um it's just it's calm so there's a, there's an inherent simplicity in this image in that you know there's not a lot of different kinds of plants mm-hmm. going on here um there's not a lot of different kinds of forms and textures going on they're very similar plants their textures and their forms are actually very similar but they're just different enough that if we pull them apart it makes sense And so some of these, you know, some of these concepts that we're proposing, while they're incredibly simple, they're incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. And so what separates the good designers from the bad designers is restraint and learning how to use this restraint in the right place and learning how to use that um, in the right place Mm -hmm. um, makes a big difference. 
I actually have to agree with Scott on that. You one. do? I do. Wow. Restraint is hard. It is very it's hard. hard. Particularly if you're plant geek, and I'm a plant geek too, but you know, you have to know when to be. Yeah. And so, another one of my favorite slides. I mean, look how simple this is the power of the few, right? Two plants, two plants. And they're basic plants. I mean, it's Liriope spicata, and it's some kind of bromeliad. This mm -hmm. is down in Costa Rica. This was actually a, a remnant of a design that Roberto Burley Marx yeah. did, the famous uh, Brazilian landscape architect. It's two plants. Yeah. And so what do we have here? It's very, very simple, right? Mm -hmm. But we have contrast of form and texture. And color. And, and color. You, the trifecta. It, it's all it, there. Bing, bing. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Oh, power of the few. Power of the few. Um, again, repeating and repetition. Um, just keeping clean lines. Just, just a few things, and it's all about the drama. It's the drama, right? You're limiting. You're dramatically limiting your plant palette, but you're locating them in the garden. You're spacing them enough to allow the uniqueness of that plant to carry through. It's so, shine. right. So if we look at the lower left-hand corner, the palms, this is found in Sarasota somewhere. It's just lawn and palms, but mm -hmm. the forms and the way these are arranged just make a very, very powerful composition. Same thing, lower right. This is one of some of my work at um, Phipps Conservatory. You can see just, there's only two plants in that composition, but the color contrast of how they pop out, the forms, the textures, just really make it an incredibly composition, uh, powerful composition. So I would encourage all of you to experiment with simplicity. Mm -hmm. So maybe mm -hmm. next year, you know, when you're working with your annual beds, this is a very cost-effective way to experiment. Mm -hmm. Just experiment with simplicity of your annual beds and try some of these techniques. It's a very low-cost way to experiment with some of these design mm -hmm. principles. Yeah, and it's it's like getting dressed. Some days you want to be flamboyant and, and very busy and other days elegant and refined. And that's what simplicity is. It's the simple elegance, looking at the line, looking at that individual plant and seeing the implicit beauty of the individual. So the lines really, um, oh. the perfect example is the lower right hand corner, right? This is one plant. This is one plant grass. It's grass it's lawn right but look at the way the lines are used in this composition to create a very powerful painting if you will you know the curvilinear nature of that mm -hmm. edge contrasting against the gravel on the left the the linear line sort of punching through it's just simple the lower left hand corner this is the a river, river of hyacinths and kukanoff um so you can see the lines that are used mm -hmm. to basically just carry your eye through the center uh, of that picture. It's just simple lines. So think about when you're designing your composition, I always say, think about where you want the person's eye to start and where you want that person's eye to finish mm -hmm. and have some kind of line that takes them there. Now, it doesn't have to be a literal line, right? Mm -hmm. It could be an informal line. It could be edges of plants that gradually take your way through a composition. But it's the simplicity of that clean line that, again, restraint makes all the difference. Yeah. Uh, restraint is so hard, but so powerful. Uh, it, you're just highlighting the individual plant. And like here, having a mass planting all the same, it makes very clean lines and immediately highlights those trees coming up i'm speaking on the left so basically it's it's a unified base planting right mm -hmm. it's 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 resisting the urge to want to plant a whole bunch of stuff right you pick one plant and you do it simply underneath of everything again it's a different tool in your toolbox mm -hmm. it's a different technique now could you argue that the picture on the lower right if that was a crazy perennial border would work yeah, it would, because it would be then you, yeah, it would be different. You'd have the repetition of the crepe myrtles that carried through that design that held it all down. But no, this particular designer, this is actually at the Getty Center in Los Angeles, decided to be super simple on the bottom. And you know, by using these, and I'm uh, agapanthus, you know, it just makes a very powerful, um, simple base planting. 
Mm -hmm. and it works yeah right it's sort of like a modern art think about modern art right mm -hmm. they're very simple shakes that like a mandarin painting mandarin painting yeah. whoa see i told you he's the wordy one and not me i know my art history yeah oh yeah um simplicity i mean look at these trees we think this is down in, in dallas arboretum mm -hmm. um and it's just the trees have been limbed up to show that artful character. And and really, so what makes what allows you to comprehend all of the insanity of these tree limbs is the simple base, base planting, mm -hmm. because the simple base planting is providing a carpet or a foil underneath solid to, green, solid green to allow the trunks to read. Now, I would totally argue if someone went underneath the here and planted all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. It would be too much. Right. Your mind couldn't wrap your head around it. And honestly, you'd focus on the ground plane mm -hmm. and not the beauty of these trunks. Yeah. So really, it's choosing the characteristic of the plant that you want to emphasize and let it be emphasized. Don't compete with it. Mm -hmm. And so a unified and simple base planning allows this picture to be the way it is. Mm -hmm. Oops, am I going the right way? We yeah. did that one before, didn't we? Let's yeah, that. we did. Let's Okay, overwhelming the scene. Oh, go ahead. You want me? To, okay. You're you're a better wordy on this one. All right, better wordy. So the upper right hand corner, Lotus Land, the, if, and it's Santa Barbara. If you've never been there, you got to go there. Um, this is just a, a masterpiece of planting. Why? Because you're just overwhelmed. I mean, look at that. You are completely overwhelmed. This is a mass planting, right? And it's just it's overwhelming. It's just powerful. I mean, when do you ever see? This sheer volume of one plant together, particularly with all these different shapes and forms. Now, notice there's not much color here. You see a little bit of red sprinkled in the midground, but it's all form and texture. Yeah. And it's just overwhelming. Um, the lower right, oh. this is Camacho now, right? That is okay, thank you. I knew, I knew. Chanticleer that. bought out the world supply of Chanticleer, uh, of Camacia and planted them in absolute mass. So for the two weeks, those Camassia are in bloom, if at all, even two weeks. That is just, is talk about Beautiful. smack Powerful. you around. Right, and it's just super simple. Yep. It's just one plant. It's one plant. But the sheer volume of the way it's used is incredibly powerful. Now, this, you can't do this everywhere. You have to have no. a pretty monumental scale landscape to be able to do something like this. Again, it's another tool in your toolbox, depending on the scale that you're working in. Oh, simplicity. Um, I, I I feel like I, I keep repeating the same thing, but it really is just highlighting the beauty of the plant. You know, it, they're just so dramatic. The Those birches on the right-hand side, oh, lust worthy. Um, and if you had a lot of busy... Um, ground layer there it you would lose that beauty right you same, would just same that we saw with the trunks for the, the texas um thing so yeah, it's the vitex right so it's it's a it's a choice but your choice needs to be based on picking a plant that has an exemplary characteristic to it so whether it is a a color like the birch trees that you mm -hmm. see on the right whether it is a texture and a color combination like you see with the apuntias on the left that's Longwood Garden, mm -hmm. um, or it's just the simple sort of grass form that you see in the lower left that is um, at a museum that escapes me right now in San Francisco. Um, so it's it's really choosing one particular amazing characteristic of a plant, right? And, and simplifying, exaggerating that very simplistically, right? Mm -hmm. So clearly with the, the, the birch trees, right? It's just the birch trees and you're letting the verticality of those trunks and you're letting the color of those trunks simply being themselves and let them be themselves. It's like a a, a good soloist. Good. I mean, they can have a backup. It's kind of a colony. Well, but, the one, but having the, that one special singer. Oh, yes, true. And then having the chorus behind. Yes. Um, and really highlight that, yeah. It's just keep it simple. All right. We've got five more slides and six more minutes. Oh, we're doing okay, well. Okay. So varying sizes. I'll go fast, right? I think 
Didn't we already do this we one? We kind of see because the same it's, slide you see again and again, there's reasons for that. So real quick, look at the um, agaves on the upper right hand corner, right? You're varying the size. It's a colony of varying size. You see little pups in the foreground. And what makes that interesting is the com contrast of the different sizes. So, mm -hmm. um, oh, view plant differently. Yeah. Mm. You know, this is hard to do sometimes. It, yeah. Um, sometimes you can take a very common plant and use it in a different situation or an unexpected or change your point of view, like an elevated platform where you're looking down on the plants. Or again, you can tell we love Chanticleer Gardens. There's Chanticleer on the right-hand side, how they have basically mirrored that planting up above with the uh, the succulent, they've mirrored it in the water. So the reflection. Um, you know, using plants, floating, floating tulips. I mean, who would have thought of them? Who would have thunk? Only Scott. So, yeah. you know, trying to find a way to use plants differently. Again, it's trying to think outside the box to get people to like, wow, I never thought to do that before. You know, experiment, try different things. You can't lose. Well, if your tulips sink, yeah, well, you can yeah, lose. But right. but yeah. Right. Yeah. Um again, common plants used in a different way. Or or even pumpkins there, laying pumpkins out. Um right. so it's just trying to be creative, trying different things. You know, it's really about just being creative and using your imagination. And, and play. Just yeah, play. play. You can't lose. You really can't. So in conclusion, have fun. Don't be so serious. We're not. There, there are, I mean, a garden is your playground and a, your garden should make you happy. So use these guidelines as guidelines. They are not rules. They're not rules, but this is where we kind of go at it right there. Design, good design is good design yes. for a reason. And Absolutely. there are there are design principles to follow. So it's how you're able to implement and utilize those design principles. So in conclusion, these are some of the things that you can make your garden great. Give careful consideration of your context. Make thoughtful selection of plants. Make strategic placement for their impact. Infuse simplicity with the bold. Remember, simplicity is a very important mm -hmm. concept. Um, limit the placement of complexity. You can't go crazy helter skelter all the time. Sometimes <laughs> pair the diminutive with the grandiose and use common materials in an uncommon way. So thank you so much. We're sorry we don't have tons of time for questions, but I'll turn it over for Cynthia. Maybe we could take one or two. I don't know, but thank you so much. It was an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Well, so first off, if Martha Stewart doesn't pick you up and put you, you the pair on uh, her show, I think she's missing out on a very special opportunity. So we'll wow. see if we can bend Martha's ear. Or they'll maybe want to just keep you to ourselves. Who knows? But the main question that has come up time and time again, and I know how it is, I'm in a small townhouse garden. How do we do this? I know I'll follow all the, the suggestions that you have, but it's it's much harder in a small garden. But somebody hit upon an element that I think is very important, especially in a small garden, maintenance. That was what do you think? Questions. So, Janet, why don't you take the small garden first and then I'll I'll try. Yeah. Small gardens are are challenging because you can't, just like the Ripley Garden, is only a third of an acre. As a public garden, that is tiny. So I can't do, well, I won't do all of the same plant because I want seasonal interest. And, and most people in a townhouse garden, they, they want that also. So by using some of the, the ideas of color, shape, and form, you can do it. Um, and, it and I, I it would is argue, challenging. Well, I would argue it's not a challenge. Oh. It, mm. any, space, any space can be designed artfully and creatively. It's how you use the space. And so think of it untraditionally. And like, you know, it's not just a, a postage stamp. You have the opportunities to have elevated pots. You have mm. the opportunity to put sculpture. You have the opportunity to, to hang stuff on your doorways, on walls. You have the opportunity to create trellises and arbors. So think more about maybe going up 
in the vertical plane instead of just staying flat. But also what's more important for smaller gardens, in my opinion, is the concept of contrast. Mm -hmm. And so the more that you get the contrast in those smaller spaces, I think the better success you'll have. So I, I don't see it as, as a challenge at all. I said it's, it's up to your creativity in terms of how you think about it and approach it. And the maintenance, you know, I don't know maintenance. I mean, that's a huge, that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, right. yeah. sorry. Yeah. That's okay. And it's a different conversation, but you gave us some tips. I thank you very much. It was just fascinating and your energy is uncompared. So thank you both thank for you giving us a great presentation. It was fabulous. I can't say enough. Now See you outside. later. Bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.